Caitlin Clark wrapping up a historic rookie year. The playoffs, of course, are still out in front of her. But last night in Washington, D.C., the uh, Washington Mystics moved their game to Capital One Arena, which is where the Wizards play. I believe that the Mystics' home arena only holds a little over 4,000 fans. So as teams have been doing this year, she they moved to the NBA arena in order to capitalize upon the star power of Caitlin Clark. And a new WNBA all-time attendance record, 20,711 on hand last night in Washington, Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, you think that uh, that would have happened had the Sky been in town last night? I mean, because Angel Reese is clearly the face of the WNBA as far as the WNBA is concerned. Well, the WNBA, they've got a little promo out right now for the playoffs, Ron. The playoffs are are coming up. And take a look at this. See if you notice. Remember on Sesame Street, they would just play the game where you would just take a look and you would just kind of try to see what was missing or what was in there. This is a tweet from the WNBA's official X account. The stage is set, eight teams, there can only be one winner. Leave your predictions on who you have being crowned the 2024 WNBA champs. And these dumb (laughs) left off their most marketable player. Imagine the NFL doing this and not not having Tom Brady on there if the Patriots were in the playoffs. I mean, this is just... Um, Imagine this is like the 1990s NBA... And for the Bulls, they've they've got like Tony Kukoc. <laughs> yeah, Horace Grant. Yeah, you got Elijah Wan, David Robinson, Patrick Ewing, and then there's Horace Grant. The NBA playoffs, 1993 NBA playoffs start tomorrow. Oh, Watch it. One one winner. It's fantastic. It <laughs> what I the mean, fuck are they doing? Why do they, they do these things? Be, honestly, Why because do they continue to do these things? Because if they would have put Caitlin Clark's picture on there, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. There's geniuses. There's super geniuses. It's it's Coke making the new formula. Like they know they clearly know what they're doing because we just make fun of them and they're like, eh, like the old saying, we've said it before on this show. No pub is bad pub. So here we are. We just reminded somebody out there watching this show that the WNBA playoffs are happening. So they got what they wanted, Ricky. We fell into their trap. Well, Ronnie, I have to tell you the the the, the graphics now on this 49, show. 49. We are, we are we are setting new we are setting new standards. Although I believe you may be a member of the forty nine forty nine forty nine forty nine club. There you go. Yeah. You go. So, but yes, uh, the Fever finished the regular season twenty and twenty, Ron which is, you know, this has been the most celebrated 500 season that a team has had in in, in a long time. They are playing the Connecticut Sun, the the, uh, WNBA playoffs. Let me educate you a little bit here, Ron. The first round of the playoffs, and I don't know if this is how the entire playoffs work or not. It It may be. I don't know if the finals are longer. But the first round, okay, okay, I'm being told. In my, in my ear here, being being told by producer Tim, three games in the first round, and then it then it moves to five games. So the opening round is a three game series. Boy, think about the uh, think about the money lost by not extending the first round. They're going to have to consider extending the, these first round series to make some more money off of Caitlin Clark. But it's a best of three. The uh, six seed uh, Indiana Fever against the number three seed Connecticut Sun. The first two games, which are the only two games that were guaranteed, are going to be in Connecticut. And then if there is a game three, I was already taking a look at this, it'll be September 27th in Indiana. So if the Fever can steal one here in Connecticut and get this thing back to Indiana on September 27th, I got to believe that that is going to be the maybe the most anticipated game in WNBA history. 
Caitlin Clark in the playoffs in an elimination game at home. Shohei Otani. Oh, 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 Otani. Unbelievable. 50-50. I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime. I remember in 1988 when Jose Canseco went 40-40 and the hysteria that was experienced with that, how is this even possible, 40-40? And here we are, 36 years later, the next step in the evolution of baseball, Shohei Otani last night, as you very likely know by now, went 6-for-6 with two doubles, three home runs, And 10 RBIs against the Miami Marlins in a beatdown, I think it was 20 to 4, and achieved the milestone that would have been considered impossible, I think, before Shohei Otani came along. I don't remember anybody ever even thinking about 50 50. He's 51 51. We've still got, what, week and a half left of the season? Can he go 55-55? Sammy Hagar couldn't drive 55. Maybe Otane can go 55-55. I put nothing outside of the reach of this guy at this point. It is fundamentally insane. He almost had a cycle last night. He got thrown out at third base trying to stretch one of his doubles into a triple. Another one of his doubles almost went out of the ballpark. So he was close to a cycle. He was close to a four-home run game. And oh, by the way, if 50-50 isn't enough, if being the first person in baseball history to go six for six with three home runs isn't enough, he also snapped his streak as the active player who had the longest playoff drought, 868 games, 866 games, I'm sorry, we want to report accurately here on the Ricky Cobb Show, 866 career games, Shohei Otani has never been to the playoffs, they clinched a playoff spot last night as well, I don't, you know, it's almost like gum disease was cured, Are we going to start ascending into heaven now? Is this the beginning of the rapture? Has anybody taken a good look at the book of Revelations lately? Is there anything in there about a Japanese guy who just emerges and becomes fucking Babe Ruth in the 21st century? And maybe better than Babe Ruth, if we're going to be honest. Let's take a look last night. Uh, A fan, there was a scramble The 50th home run ball, and God knows what that's going to be worth on the collectibles market. Take a look at the scrum that occurred in Miami last night on uh, Otani's number 50. This is the second of his three home runs. And you can see here, it looks like there's a blue light special at Kmart. It's the first scene of Saving Private Ryan. Look at that guy. He's having the highlight of his life it's the happiest that guy's been since he lost his virginity but I got a good look at him there I'm not sure he's lost it yet look at this I don't know who came up with the ball but I hope that they got it authenticated by the Major League Baseball authenticators who were no doubt on the scene last night somebody is going to They didn't, oh my God, I'm being told by producer Tim that it was not authenticated. Well, there's a, there's an unforced error. I hope that they have some means of proving that that ball is what it is because that's very possibly a seven figure item. You know, there's some asshole out there that's willing to pay an obscene amount of money for that baseball. Um, I'm going to say that this is like a fucking movie. Sometimes occasionally in sports, and I think it's the reason, one of the big reasons that we love sports so much, and it's easy to get jaded, 
particularly as an adult, particularly as a crusty middle-aged adult, it's easy to get jaded sometimes and forget why we fell in love with sports in the first place. But nights like last night can remind us. I don't want to go all Terrence Mann talking to Ray Kinsella on his farm in Iowa here, the late, great James Earl Jones. But I will say that it's nights like last night. That's the reason we fell in love with sports when we were kids. That's the reason we became baseball fans. That pure joy, the pure spectacle of seeing something that you thought that you would never see. The electricity of all of it. Shohei Otani doing things that we never thought possible. A guy who, as a pitcher, has a 38-19 and 19 career record. A guy who would be pitching for the Dodgers this year and pitching well had he not undergone Tommy John surgery. And so this year, the two-way threat, the guy who has averaged almost 11 and a half strikeouts per nine innings over the course of his career, a higher rate than Nolan Ryan, and I know the game has changed. But this guy strikes out more people per nine innings than Nolan Ryan did. Oh, and by the way, he's a 50-50 man. Is this guy the greatest baseball player who ever played? He got a standing ovation on the road. Of course he did. Anybody with a pulse should have been on their feet, particularly if you're a fucking Miami Marlins fan. Now, I said, this could be a Disney movie. Honestly, it really could be. And if it was a movie, I'm going to give the award for Best Supporting Actor in this show business moment that occurred in Miami last night to the Marlin skipper, Skip Schumacher, who was caught on film in the dugout. The lip readers could tell. They were talking about, do you want to intentionally walk Otani? Skip Schumacher says, fuck that. I have too much respect for the guy for that shit to happen. Skip Schumacher making some fans last night as well. That's the fucking competitive spirit. Walking Otani at any point last night. What what a dick move that would have been. We've got Skip Schumacher's comments after the game here. Let's listen to the manager of the Miami Marlins. You, you, I think that's a bad move baseball-wise, karma-wise, baseball god-wise. You, you go after him and see if you can get him out. Um, and I think um, out of respect for the game, we're, we're going to go after him. He hit the home run. I mean, you know, that's just part of the deal. He's hit 50 of them. Um, he's the most talented player I've ever seen. Um, he is doing things that I've never seen done before, before in the game. Um, and if he has a couple more of these peak years, he might be the best ever to play the game. Um, I'm not sure he needs any more peak years to have a valid claim as the best who's ever played the game. Look, Are his counting stats going to end up number one in any category? No, he's not going to retire with the most home runs. He's not going to retire with the most hits. He's not going to retire with the highest batting average. He's not going to end up with counting stats as a pitcher that are going to rival the greats of the game. But when you put the package all together, this is a guy who finished fourth in American League Cy Young voting just a few years ago, two or three years ago. He's got a 15-win season. I believe he had something like 230-plus strikeouts that year as well. Can you imagine a world, when you were 12 years old, when you were 18 years old, when you were, fuck, grown, if you're an older guy, let's go back to our 20s. Could you have comprehended somebody going 50-50? And then what if I said on top of that, well, he's also a former 15-game winner who had 200-plus strikeouts in a season and a low uh, 2 ERA. His ERA was like 230-something that year. He's a Cy Young caliber pitcher. If he comes back from Tommy John surgery with everything that he had before the surgery, in terms of the health of his arm, he is not somebody that you can write off 
as a guy who will never win a Cy Young Award. He has that level of ability. Will he? It's a big ask. Is he capable of it? Yeah, based on the Otani that we saw in Anaheim, he is capable of being in that conversation any given year. What happens if he goes forward and wins the Cy Young Award? Can you can you imagine a world in which a guy goes 50-50 and picks up a Cy Young? Let's talk about this 50-50 just for another moment. The There have been like five guys, I think, who had uh, 20 stolen bases or more, and I'm going off the top of my head. I believe it was A-Rod, Griffey Jr., Brady Anderson. Remember that year that Brady Anderson discovered the medicine in the cabinet? Wink, allegedly, and hit 50 home runs, just random, randomly out of nowhere. And Willie Mays, all of those guys had 50-20 seasons. Willie Mays was the most prolific. In 1955, Willie Mays hit 51 homers, and he stole 24 bases. So there wasn't even a member of the 50-25 club before Shohei Otani hit that 50th homer last night. 51-51 and counting, he has made Major League Baseball Little League. Remember when we played Little League and the dominant kid was the best pitcher and the best hitter? That's how it was in almost every little town around America when I was a kid. Very good chance that you remember the name of that kid from your Little League. Shohei Otani is doing that at the highest level there is. And we should all consider ourselves lucky that we're witnesses to this. I believe Jose Canseco tweeting about it. If we have the graphic of the Jose uh, Canseco tweet, he says, 35 years ago, I created the 4040 Club. It was 36, but who's counting, Jose? Shohei Otani created the 50-50 tonight. Congratulations to him. Jose Canseco taking a break from fighting midgets on pay-per-view or whatever side project he has going on now to chime in on Twitter. We would we would love we would love to get Jose on. Yeah, return Ernie's phone call, Jose. Come on the program. I'll I'll lob you softballs, buddy. I promise. I'll be nice to you. Come on the show. Um Freezing Cold Takes is a good X account. They uh they keep the receipts on the things that people say online. You know it's It's a luxury that we have in this modern era to be provocative, and I think that this is one of the things that drives the hot take sort of uh, sports commentary culture that we live in, because when you have a hot take, if it doesn't work out, everybody pretty much forgets it in 15 minutes and moves on to the next stupid thing that they're going to be preoccupied with. So you can just sort of just play lottery tickets all the time with your takes and if one out of 50 works out, you can use that to your advantage to build your brand and build your career. And the 49 that you miss on, everybody just loses them in the shuffle. But uh, freezing cold takes is always there to remind us of the things that people say, which is a nice public service. The Sporting News in 2018, I believe this was, said Major League Scouts believe Shohei Otani won't be able to hit big league pitching. And the quote from someone, and this guy should be uh, eternally grateful that he's not name-checked in this. I don't know if he was an anonymous scout or if his name was in the article, because if his name's in the article, we need to go out there and find it. Some guy said, he's basically like a high school hitter. I don't know what high school you went to, buddy. But that's a pretty badass high school. We had Joe Madden, the world championship manager of the 2016 Chicago Cubs on this program on Monday. And he managed Otani in Anaheim, of course, for uh, parts of three seasons. And I asked Joe Madden on Monday his thoughts on the season that Shohei Otani is having. What he does when he does both um, is unimaginable. There's nobody else. There may be, I don't know, I can't say never, but maybe 20 years from now, I don't know when that next person is going to come along, that next guy is going to come along to do that. It's that It's that freakish. I mean, it's like you're, 
little league ball when you're you play in little league and you're the best hitter on the team and you're the best pitcher but you play what twice a week whatever it's just it, it's just him it's he's he's driven he wants to be the the greatest of all time i uh, whenever anybody mentions that it's got to be shohei's number one babe Ruth's number two whatever um he's driven um he's driven and he's committed and he's got a process that he sticks to all right let's think about it let's let's get to that question joe making the little league analogy talking about the preparation process that otani goes through we know what he can do now when he focuses exclusively on hitting he can go 50 50 i've always wondered you know i always thought when you get to the major league level it starts to become very specialized even babe ruth a hundred years ago babe ruth gave up pitching when he became an everyday player and that's the thing that we always use when we say Babe Ruth is the greatest of all time. And I would say, up until this year, I would say Babe Ruth is the greatest of all time. And the argument for that is, well, he hit 714 home runs. He posted unbelievable hitting statistics. And he was a damn good pitcher before he became an everyday player. Shohei Otani shows up. About 100 years later, about 100 years after Ruth was giving up pitching, and he does both. And the only reason he wasn't doing both this year is because of the Tommy John surgery. Now, how much has the pitching hurt his hitting? He had a 46 home run season. He won 15 games one year. He had a 46 homer season one year. He was having pitching and hitting at the same time. And I thought, well, geez, I guess nothing affects this guy. Pitching is evidently not hurting his hitting. Maybe pitching has been hurting his hitting a little bit. If his true level is 50-50, can you imagine that what we've actually seen is an Otani who, because of his pitching focus, wasn't really hitting at 100% capacity of what he was capable of? So we got to ask ourselves the question. Is this kid from Japan the greatest baseball player who ever lived? And I'm talking about peak value. As I said, he's not going to end up having the highest war of anybody unless he ages like a fine wine. I don't think the counting stats are going to be that impressive. Aaron Judge has a higher war this year. And who gives a shit? Who would you rather have on your team, Aaron Judge or Shohei Otani? I mean, it's a it's a fair question. But if Otani's arms healthy, how can it not be Shohei Otani? And who would you rather have in the history of baseball? Would you rather have Barry Bonds? Back in the era when he hit 73 homers in a year, he had a year where he posted an on-base percentage of over 600. Juiced. Most likely. Would you rather have Babe Ruth, who 100 years ago was putting up incredible numbers in a, let's be honest, a segregated league with guys who were really playing a different game than the game that we have today? I'm always a proponent of judging people within the era that they played in. When people say, oh, well, Babe Ruth, he couldn't hit a 93 mile an hour slider. Or whatever, and I always say, well, send these kids from today back to the 1920s. Let them have 1920s training techniques, which were basically non-existent. Let them ride trains everywhere. Let them play with dirty baseballs. Let them not have access to all the things that have allowed them to be who they are in modern times, and then compare them to Babe Ruth. Because if Babe Ruth came along today, guess what? He would have been playing travel ball. He would have been, you know, can you imagine Babe Ruth in shape? What the fuck could the guy have done if he wasn't pounding 12 hot dogs a day and having sex with syphilitic prostitutes? Babe Ruth would have had the advantages of the modern game. But look, I got to tell you, if you sent 2024 Shohei Otani Back to the era of Babe Ruth, 
who I have always considered the greatest, they would think that he was practicing wizardry. He would be burned at the stake for doing supernatural things. They would have said, this Japanese motherfucker is a warlock. Because what he's doing now would have been incomprehensible a hundred years ago. And as I bring in the international streaming star, my sidekick, Ronnie T-Shirts, Ronnie, what Shohei Otani's doing was incomprehensible 10 years ago. Maybe five years ago. It's insane. Cheryl Swoops is not impressed. <laughs> Cheryl Swoops, when reached for comments, said, eh, those numbers don't look dominant to me. Nope. Uh, as a non-baseball fan, but a sports fan, like I I might have been the first person to to text you last night, right? That it happened. Like it's pretty badass, right? Like were, it's pretty actually. badass. It's yeah. pretty badass to be witness to greatness in sports. And as these things always, always have when, when these things happen, they always lead me, lead my mind into other sports and other things that like I've gotten to see in my lifetime, because it's kind of inco- like you said, it's incomprehensible that we saw happen what happened. And you, you alluded to it that they have about a week and a half. Like I checked, they've got nine games left. So I'm assuming he he's not going to play all of them, but I mean, he easily could get 55, 56 home runs, right? And maybe some stolen bases. So back to my my original thought. Gretzky, uh, Tiger Woods, Carl Lewis, Usain Bolt. Who else, Ricky, have we witnessed competing in their sport that it just feels like, even though, like you said, that uh, judges' numbers were were better, his war was better. I'm going off a feel here. Like, who else have we witnessed where it just feels like, man, that guy's so much better than his peers? It's rare. It's rare when you see someone who is performing at a level where you just think this isn't, this this almost isn't fair, and Otani is verging up on that. That's how I felt about Tiger Woods. You mentioned Tiger Woods. That's how I felt about Tiger Woods in the early 2000s. In 2000, Tiger Woods won the U.S. Open by 15 strokes. Mm-hmm. He finished 12 under par at Pebble Beach. Second place, I believe it was Ernie Els and Miguel Angel Jimenez. Jimenez. If I'm not mistaken, they both finished plus three. You can fact check me on that, but that's the kind of shit I carry around on my hard drive. (laughs) Tiger Woods followed that up the following month by going to, uh, I believe it was St. Andrews in 2000. He won the British Open by eight shots. Uh, So, you know, I mean, good Lord, dude. When you're talking about somebody who is performing at a level that is just cartoonish. Yeah, you've put yourself on a very, very short list of athletes in the history of sports. You have what Ruth was doing in the early days of Major League Baseball. You have what Gretzky did, as you mentioned Gretzky. You've got Michael Phelps in swimming. Jordan in basketball. It's a short fucking list, Ron. And to think that the guy goes 50-50 on a night when he goes 6-for-6, his batting line last night in the box score was 6-4-6-10. Three home runs, two doubles, two stolen bases. You could live to be 100, and you'll probably never see anybody do that again. And there's a very good chance that you won't see anybody get 50-50 again. Is it possible? It's possible. But hitting 50 is real hard. It ain't like the 30-30 club or even the 40-40 club. 50 stolen base seasons in modern day baseball are practically unheard of. It doesn't happen very often. 50 home run seasons are pretty rare. To marry the two together, 
It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning, Ron. And you know what else is stunning? When we when we have Championship Friday with the Super 70 Sports Poll of the Day, and that's what we have going on today, the winners from Monday through Thursday square off to declare the champion of the week. And before we take a look at the Championship Edition poll today here on Friday, I think that we know the winner, Ron, and you made you made the error that I make sometimes. Yep. You just pick something that was just a little too strong. I haven't peeked at the results yet. I don't know what's going on. I can see we've got over 5,000 votes that have come in already. But I can tell you, Ron, a good night's sleep, I feel very confident, is going to run away with this. Much like bacon, much like beer, it's just it's just too goddamn powerful. Yeah, man. At some point, maybe at the end of maybe the end of this calendar year, we should uh, just take what we think are the four biggest ones, just based off of our thoughts, and and pair those against each other because there's just no chance a good night's sleep is losing this one, like zero chance. I assume that you would vote for a good night's sleep here. Oh, oh God, yes. Pulp Fiction, I mean, this is a tough one. A journey is, I think Journey's going to finish last. Yep. I think, I think Pulp Fiction is going to finish second. And I think A Good Night's Sleep is going to win. It, Pulp Fiction is like one of my two or three favorite movies. Obviously, I love WKRP. Unlike you, I appreciate Journey. Even though I'm not like the world's biggest Journey fan, but Steve Perry, as I once tweeted... Uh, you know, of of the most uh, stressful and, and traumatic relationships of my life, at least three of the top five have been Steve Perry's relationships because he just invests me in them so much. I feel Steve Perry's pain when he's having trouble with, with a lady. But uh, let's go ahead, Producer Tim. Producer Tim, uh, we're going to see how much he values sleep. Well, there it is. No, uh, no real surprises here. A good night's sleep outpacing Pulp Fiction and WKRP in Cincinnati that are look like they're going to battle it out for the silver. And Steve Perry uh, bringing bringing up the the rear there, Ron. A good night's sleep. It's just too good. I don't know, dude. It's like. We should have like bacon against beer against a good night's sleep. That might be a pretty good horse race. Yeah, just do a three one. That would actually be interesting. A good night's sleep is is lower uh today than it was when it when we did it earlier in the week. So at least uh pulp fiction and KRP taking a little bit away from it. But yeah, man. Well producer I- producer Tim is in my ear just saying that, you know, it's disappointing that no food product made it to the championship round. I think this is the I think this is the first time that we've gotten to championship Friday and we we didn't bring something delicious with us, Ron. Yeah, a good night's sleep's still gonna win. I just I just it's just too important now. And it's I think what it is, not that it's too important, it's too elusive, right? That's why everybody's putting it down is because it's elusive. <laughs> it gets more and more elusive. Yeah. The, old, the older I get, the more elusive it becomes. Although I'm a pretty good sleeper, so, you know, I don't know what to tell you. One tweet. I tweet things. So uh, what am I tweeting? God only knows what is going on over on X. I should remember, but I don't. Here we go. Long John Silvers. You know, I, I have uh, talked about Pizza Hut a lot. And I have reminisced about Galaga and the jukebox and the cocktail table Pac-Man machines and those piping hot skillets that they would bring out and set on the table and they would have to warn you that it was hot and you'd have to make sure that you didn't burn your fingers and then the pizza would be so hot from that skillet that it would take about 85% of the roof of your mouth with it on that first bite. I love old school Pizza Hut, but you know what you shouldn't sleep on? You shouldn't sleep on old school Long John Silvers either, my friends. 
It was a goddamn special occasion. As I say here, you didn't walk inside a Long John Silver's in the 70s and 80s so much as you boarded that motherfucker, Ron. Look at the hmm. pier, the ropes outside. <laughs> then you get in there, they give you a fucking pirate hat. Even if you were a grown-ass man, look at these people. There's not one child among them. Look at that group. They look like they're ready for anything. Pirate hats going. Long John Silver's, sadly, a dynasty that crumbled before our very eyes, Ron. It shouldn't have happened. Hey, man, can we talk about something? The uh, I don't even know what they're called, but it's those salty, oily, crackling things that were at the bottom of your little paper boat tray thing that was from the the excess you know salty the excess. oily crackling things you know you know what i'm talking I about believe, though, right of course i do i believe that people commonly call them cracklins but okay. i believe that they are no i believe that they are known by long john silvers i could be mistaken but i believe that they officially call them crumbs Ron, oh. not to be confused with the great Rex crumb. Yeah, that's but that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. And I used to, I used to, I used to order side orders of them, bro. Were they given to you for free or did you have to pay for them? I think they were free. Like truly, a different time in America, they just scoop you out like a spatula full, put them in a little basket, dude, and it was the the best. Yeah, crumbs. Oh, put some, vin- put some vinegar some and salt malt on them. Vinegar on them. Yeah, oh, exactly. the malt vinegar, dude. Oh, 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 come on. Now. <laughs> oh, like, how bad do you want to go to Long John Silver's now? I don't know. Hey, Outkick fans on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and make your way over to Outkick.com where you can watch the full episode.